Welcome to the Outside Game Podcast. It is your boy, Keith the host with the most, with my man, Don Povia, riding shotgun. What's up, Don? Welcome to Super Bowl week, Mr. Monday night. We are joined not by one yourself, big market linebacker, but we are joined by two major market linebackers here. Talk some football. That's a, that's a stretch, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I played in Tennessee for 10 years, and my last year was in New York. So trust me, I know about the small market and you being in the Saints, uh, Carolina and Buffalo, you've had your fair share of mid mid small market so yeah. yep welcome to the show aj klein linebacker for the buffalo bills as keith mentioned uh both with carolina and uh new orleans before that aj welcome i appreciate you guys having me where are you uh are you in new york right now or did you head home yeah i'm, I'm, uh, I'm still in new york still in buffalo um actually enjoying one of the few uh sunny days that we've had in the, the last few weeks but um just kind of easing into this off season process after the season ended and um, try not to rush anything. Just take my time and enjoy it. But yeah, I'm, um, I went to school at Syracuse, so I'm used to Eastern New York, those Northeast yeah. areas, the lake effect snow. Um, so yeah, you know, more power to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, compared that. to uh, most of my neighbors here have been saying that this year has been pretty mild. So I guess I've been pretty lucky with the amount of snowfall and how warm it's actually been. So <laughs> I was, um, you know, speaking of which, obviously you just got Buffalo this year in 2020. How was the first year of COVID football? Because like Don said, you're our first guest post, um, well, not post COVID, but during COVID. But what yeah. was it like? I and mean, how did you, um, you guys adjust? Because obviously Buffalo, you guys had a great season. But take us through that a little bit. I mean, definitely every, everything changed. Um, the protocols, the testing, the contact tracers, um, meeting setups. I mean, we can go back to when we first reported back in, um, well, actually now we, before we first reported April, May, week April, like? April, May, June, we didn't have OTAs. Everything was virtual. So everybody had to get set up with zoom and get up set up with like coach me plus and all these different apps and stuff that we never had to use. Um, but once we got back, we were doing daily testing every single day, the swabs, um, you had to fill out a questionnaire every single day around the facility. You always had to be wearing a mask. Um, in every meeting and then we had we basically set up all of our meetings in the indoor to where tables could be six foot apart and big big projection screens at the front of rooms um so it was definitely definitely different i mean even, even with the food situation everything was pre-prepared packaged in under heat lamps like usually you have your cafeteria where you go up get stuff made to order that was all different um so definitely some hurdles that we had to overcome throughout the year but i think once we got into it it just became routine. Um, I can't say it's a routine that everybody enjoyed. I mean, obviously I didn't enjoy it at all times, but we needed to do what we had to do to be able to play all 16 games and keep everybody healthy first and foremost. Um, obviously because everything was on a learning curve this year. This is the first time I think major sports and even um, the entire country has had to deal with anything like this. So obviously learning more and more week to week, day, to day by day. So, um, but I think from top down in our organization, they handled it with um, the best that they could. And I think uh, McDermott and Bean and, and even the Pagulas um, set us up for, for success. And obviously it translated to the field, obviously to let us be able to focus on what we need to focus on and, and that being football and not let it become a distraction. So question I had was uh, back on the field side. I mean, New York was one of the most states out there. Um, you didn't have any fans all season at home, correct? No, yeah. We had no fans until the playoffs. Um, and, man, it was a, it's definitely different. I mean, I, I think our atmosphere, I mean, um, maybe it's just being an outdoor stadium, but I think when we went to uh, Arizona had – I don't know if Arizona had fans or not. Yeah, Arizona had some fans, but when we went to Vegas – and um, played there, and they had no fans either. But playing in domes is like almost eer eerie quiet um, because, like, between TV timeouts, literally they would just cut everything off. And we'd have one of the guys on the sideline will like whoop or yell or something. You just hear the echoes through the stadium. So that's a little weird. But um, being in Buffalo, being outside, I mean, it, it's just something you got used to, I guess. But when we got fans back in the stands for the playoffs, it was a, it was a huge 
a huge boost in energy. I mean, that's one thing in that, that show this year is like, if you can't create your own energy as a team, you're going to struggle. We, I think, I feel like as a team, we created our own energy. And even when we're on the road or we're at home and you, you, you feel that other team kind of like just draining, you know what I mean? I think not having fans and not having that momentum swing that comes along with big plays in the, in the, in the atmosphere. I mean, it really affected football games. I think people don't really realize that as much as it, of the true effect it did have. Yeah, that's something I was going to get to, and I'm glad you beat me to it, was the energy. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of times on third and long or third and short as a defense, you're going to that crowd or on a big third down play or a big play, you know, the crowd gets behind you. Um, So without that energy, it must have been crazy. So now moving forward, um, have they said anything about the offseason protocol or how that's going to go? Well, I think um, from what I know and how uh, it's been given to us, so when, when our season ended, we had seven days that if you wanted to come into the facility, you still had to test um, per NFL protocol. Um, but now I think once that seven days post-season ending is done, I think it's now up to every team to come up with their own protocols or whatever they want to keep in place for the offseason um, until we know a little bit more, uh, more about what's going to happen this April with workouts and with uh, with OTAs and all that kind of stuff. So I think right now it falls on each team and how they want to go about their business. Um, as for us, I'm not sure. I haven't been back to the facility since exit meetings, um, but I'm, I'm sure that's one thing I'm going to check if I do head back to the facility while I'm here. Um, check on to see if we're doing the protocols with the testing and all that stuff too. So, but it's I, I'm, as, as far as I know, every team does their own thing, I guess. How do you feel? Is that fair? Do players feel that that's fair? Again, being in a more restrictive state, going and playing an away game where, and obviously, you guys, you guys finished twelve and four. I mean, it didn't affect you too much. Um, you know, those stadiums where fans were able to be in there and, and root for the team. You know, that lack of consistency. I mean, how do guys take that? Does it matter? Um, uh, to be honest, I don't believe it matters because even if there's 100,000 fans in the stands, like you're still out there to do your job. Um, obviously, you have the external factors that could affect the outcome of a game like we talked about with Keith earlier with energy and the momentum swings. But um, I know for us, we just wanted to have some fans in the stands. But, um, yeah, it, 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 it was for us and not having any fans the whole regular season – and, and seeing places like Florida or Arizona or some of these states. I'm sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Um, oh, you're good. So we, I know, I know the Pagulas were, were, uh, were in touch with uh, Governor Cuomo for the, the entire season to try to get fans in the stands. Um, but like, again, it's an unprecedented type of situation, so we just had to roll with the punches. I think some guys – I mean, I was frustrated that we didn't have fans because you see other states that can have them, but I get it. You know what I mean? Each state kind of governs itself, and that's just the way we're set up as a country. So um, just had to roll with the punches. Well, going into this week, the Super Bowl is going to have limited fans. Um, you've been on the field with both of these teams at some point in your career. Definitely, um, you know, with uh, – this new season how do you think this is going to play out who's your Super Bowl pick and look the dynamic of these two quarterbacks you have the future in Patrick Mahomes and you have the boat in Tom Brady so. yeah I mean it's it's hard to it's hard to pick really um, <laughs> you think it could be a toss-up and even when when Tampa made the playoffs um and chatter around the locker room, chatter around the league. I mean, all the medias were like, man, if he gets to another Super Bowl, he kind of cements himself. And they're like, well, is he really going to do it? Do they have the opportunity? But I know one thing, like, I'm a big fan of defensive football, obviously. And the the defense for the Buccaneers has been playing outstanding. Um, I love watching Devin White play. I think he's a phenomenal player. He's always around the ball, making plays on the ball. Um but then you, I mean, to me, it comes down to whoever has the best game defensively. I mean, Mahomes is going to make plays, Brady's going to make plays, but it's going to come down to those one or two big time plays, either forced turnovers or 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 a, a four and out in a critical situation. 
Um, because both of these teams are going to make plays offensively. It's like who can make that one or two big plays defensively to kind of tilt it in their favor. So I think the toss up, um, a part of me would like to see Tom Brady win again, just because of his legacy that he's already made. Um, but I, I, I would say I'm going to pick KC, um, at the end of the day, I think they're just playing great football. They, they have so many pieces across the offensive side of the football. Um, in my own, and just play at a different level. Um, not to say that I'll, I'll pick Casey, but it's going to be a toss up. <laughs> you know, Keith, oh, sorry, yeah, Keith. No, I was going to say, um, I was going to get to you. You had one of your better games um, against a Kyler Murray who was similar to a Patrick Mahomes, you know, getting out of the pop, pocket and all that in Arizona this year. And you guys had that game in the bag. You know, yeah. um, what is the difference if you could tell the listeners going against um, a mobile quarterback like a Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes versus a pocket passer? Um, obviously, it changes up your your third down package um, a lot. I mean, with with a uh, for instance, for us versus KC, we had certain um, flush rushes to get the quarterback out of the pocket with a guy kind of sitting there with the catcher's mitt. Um, whereas with a pocket pass, you're going to bring up the middle pressure, try to push him off his spot so he can't step up in the pocket. You can't have these two edge rushers getting deep past the quarterback. It doesn't work that way. With this pocket passers, they'll just step up. And the same thing with uh, Mahomes or, or Kyler Murray. Like you said, if you give them escape lanes in the B-gaps or you allow them to be able to roll outside the pocket, they're just going to keep the play alive with their feet um, for six, seven, eight seconds until somebody uncovers um, so there's challenges for both, but I, 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 I would much rather go against the pocket passer, to be honest. Um, they're more predictable. You know what you're going to get. Um, I mean, and especially with guys that can freelance and, and be off schedule as successful as, as uh, Mahomes and Kyler Murray can be. I mean, that just brings a whole other dynamic, and that puts so much pressure on the back end. So if you don't have your rush coordinated with your coverage, you're in for a long day. You were in the Super Bowl five years ago with yeah. uh, with with Carolina, and I mean that was the height of, of Cam Newton MVP year. Uh, you guys were flirting with uh, you know making Mercury Morris, Morris cry, um, breaking that, that undefeated uh, streak. Um, you know, I, know, I think Keith said last week. You know, he would love to see Tom go out, win another one, but could see Mahomes going forth and, and breaking all Tom's records one day. Um, you know, I would think five years ago, people might have had that same impression of, of Cam Newton. What does Mahomes have in common with Cam or, and what is he, you know, what is he different with? Um, first and foremost, off schedule throws and, and athletic ability to extend plays. Um, and then over, before Cam had his surgeries and, and his, his arm shoulder problems, this guy could throw the ball in any window, I mean, you look at some of the highlight games from 15, even 16 and 17, when he was still rel- when he was still healthy. Cam was putting this ball into places that nobody would think to throw a football because he would rely so heavily on his arm, st- arm strength, to throw off his back foot, can throw on a run. Um, that is reflected in Mahomes' game. Obviously, he, he has all the ability and the confidence. I think is the the biggest thing to be honest. You see that same. It's not cocky, arrogant confidence. It's confidence that, hey, I can make any throw when I want, and I'm going to do it in the tightest windows, and I'm going to smile when I do it. Uh, but the big difference with Cam from Mahomes is Cam is also running quarterback powers um, and uh, definitely a threat in the run game. And you don't see Patrick Mahomes supermanning over the top of people um, trying to score touchdowns and, and don't get me wrong he'll run it when he has to but there's no there's no uh call the quarterback run game with him. so that you um i want to stay in carolina because in your in your um linebacker room you had some great players and tommy davis and luke keekley luke keekley being one of my favorite linebackers to watch um you know, what was it like playing with Luke and Tommy? And then also um, knowing Luke dealing with the percussion situation, seeing him retire so early. Talk about having to be a backup, always ready to play, and never knowing when you're going to get that call. Um, obviously, Luke's a first ballot Hall of Famer and arguably one of the best linebackers to ever play the game, um, if not the best. I think his, his pre-snap 
reads and, and, and pre-snap diagnosis of formations and his, his formation recognition is better than, I mean, you can see the, the, uh, like the NFL films clips of him calling out plays before they run. And you'll have quarterbacks that say the same thing. Um, his, his ability to, um, cause obviously everybody studies film different. I studied different film, film, um, from Luke, Luke would be different than Thomas. Like, I mean, everybody's different, but his ability to, um, I don't think I've seen somebody sit and watch as much as him. Um, and it obviously played off on, on game day, but it's not even that. He's just an athletic freak as well. You can see him and how he would bend, dip, move, um, run through gaps back door that he necessarily shouldn't and be fast enough to make the play. Um, he's he's definitely one of a kind. He's a great friend of mine too. Obviously, we stay in touch and now he's transitioned out of the league, but um, – I can say his, his retirement caught me by a little bit by surprise last year. Um, but I mean, I, I know him and I know how he wants to play the game. And I feel like um, it was the best decision for him to move forward what he felt comfortable with. So I can't, I can't knock anything that he's done or the decision that he's made because at the end of the day, our health is most important. Um, I mean, football, fo- he can always be involved in football uh, in some form or fashion. I know he misses playing, but, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if you don't have your health, what do you have? Absolutely. Um, you know, talk a little bit about Buffalo now. Um, again, quite a run. Uh, did you kind of have that underdog chip on your shoulder all this time? We've talked about some great quarterbacks that you either played with or against. Um, you know, your quarterback up there in Buffalo threw for about 4,500 yards this year. Uh, is the best yet to come up there? And, and, and what does yeah, the, I, I, the outlook yeah. look like? I think the best is definitely yet to come. And don't, don't forget to uh, mention the, well, how many rushing touchdowns did he have this year? I'd have to look it up, but yeah. <laughs> but I mean, again, you talk about dual, a, a dual threat quarterback. Um, Josh is, Josh has all the, 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 uh, the check marks that you need. You know what I mean, when you, when you look down the list of what you want a quarterback, he's got it. So yes, the best is yet to come here in Buffalo. Um, I, I definitely been, um, I didn't understand necessarily like the overall, um, not underdog mentality, but you come into a new place that you haven't been a part of. Right. And you have success and you see kind of the city and how it's rallied behind. I think that's the craziest thing. We've had, had the best year in 25 years, right. Or 24 years, whatever it is in the city of Buffalo. And we have COVID we can't have fans in the stands. So the whole city was just teeming with energy. It wanted to be in that stadium. And I could say that once those playoffs hit and we had fans in the stands, I think we had 6,700 or something. It felt like there were 60,000. Um, how many tables were broken that weekend? I don't know. Too many. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know our first two wins you, you'd see on the feed, um, all across Instagram, or whatever of, of, of people breaking tables, which, <laughs> which is awesome to see. And I, I, have, I look forward to this coming season and be able to finally experience, because obviously I came here and played, um, when I was with the saints in 17 and, and I don't want to say it, but we, when I was with the saints, we beat them pretty good. So, but I would love to see Bill's mafia, and, and what type of energy they bring now um, moving forward, especially not having uh, having a full year, of not being able to be in the stands. They're going to be routing and ready to go for next year. Um, and we have a lot of talent, man. We're, we're, we're going to be a good football team for the next few years. Yeah, and um, you, you definitely came in and settled in well towards the end of the year, you know, playing the roles that they asked you to play. Obviously, it's not obvious. I don't know if people know that you um, had a defensive player of the week game um, late in the season against the Chargers. Uh, with that said, how do you feel that you fit into the fold as a veteran and how have you obviously playing with the people that you played with throughout your career? How have you feel that you've grown as a football player on and off the field? Um. I think I think accepting not accepting but um, coming here to Buffalo I had 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 uh, clear conversations with Bean and McDermott and what would be expected of me right um, didn't come in with any uh, predetermined like role of like hey this is what you're going to be and this is all that you're going to be no my role is really flexible and I understood that coming in and um, being asked to play multiple positions um, play on teams when I need to. And I think that's something that I had to do when I was in Carolina. And then I had the ability to be a, a true starter um, 
in, in New Orleans. I actually still had some special teams responsibilities, even in New Orleans as a full-time starter. But um, I think having a uh, clear line of communication with the coaches, the staff and what they expect of me makes my job really easy. Um, having to be ready at any moment, any, any moment, whether um, I'm thrown in late in the game because of an injury or one week I'm playing a different position because that's where they want me. Like I'm at that point in my career where I've, I've, uh, I feel like I have a great understanding of defenses and schemes and, um, no matter where they put me, I feel like I can be successful. Yes. This year was a little bit of a learning curve coming off of playing Mike, um, in, in New Orleans for three years straight and not playing anything different. Um, and then unfortunately Matt went down with his injury. So I had to move over to Will. And that was the first time I'd taken snaps at Will since my third year in Carolina when Thomas got hurt. Um, so yeah, that was a little bit of adjustment. It took me a, a couple of weeks to settle in, but I think now I'm back to that point where it's like, all right, I know where I can go. I know where I can play. You can flip flop me and it's not going to make a difference. So, um, being ready to go at any moment for me is the biggest thing. That's called value. So added yeah. value. <laughs> the more you can yeah, do. That, hey, that's why, that's why I said it's like, if, if, if that's fine, because I know, I know my value and I know that right. at the end of the day, I believe that I can play in this league as long as I want to play in this league. Um, obviously barring any injuries. Right. For um, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel good with where I'm at and I definitely uh, look forward to, to continuing to grow. I mean, that's all I can really ask for at this point. I think that's the maturity um, that uh, a lot of players don't really get to because you come in with certain goals early in your career. They don't go your way and you kind of feel you figure it out. You got to get in where you fit in. Then you get that opportunity. Look, you, three year, 15 mil. That's a great opportunity. You make the most of it. And then you prove that, like you said, you can do anything in this league you can do. I feel like a lot of players miss that throughout their career, either because they don't get to that point or just don't get that maturity level to understand the business side of the game and yeah. how it works. And I, and I think for me, that's understanding the business side and growing, because obviously everybody has expectations to come in. Hey, I'm going to be a starter. You're not going to tell me I have to play special teams. I'm going to be the man. I'm going to like, I'm going to do all these things. Right. And then reality slaps a lot of guys in the faces. Um, and you have to be able to roll with the punches, understand it's a business. Um, like you said, get, get your value from where. And I think first and foremost for a lot of guys, if I can say one thing, is, is special teams is a huge thing for guys that aren't going to be the top three-round draft picks. Um, I've seen a lot of guys, obviously one of my teammates, Mario Addison, and me and Mario played together on special teams for my four years in Carolina. It was like me and him, right, being next to each other on punt, on kickoff, on kickoff return. We did it all. And, and then Mario goes on to be one of the – what was in 17, 18, 19, I think he led the uh, the Panthers in sacks for three years straight or something crazy. Um, but like I said, it was, again, adding your value on special teams and once you get your opportunity to run with it. So, yeah, I've been fortunate, though. So, AJ, one thing I'd like to ask guys is, uh, you know, if you weren't playing football, what would you be doing? I did I did learn you're a big Ovid Brothers fan. I did. I saw, How'd you learn Ovid Brothers? Well, yeah. I poked around a little bit. You know, I find things around. out. Yeah. <laughs> He's down there in Nashville. He's got ears down there in, the, in that whole scene. <laughs> no, they're, they're great, man. They're awesome. I love them. They're one of my I, favorite bands. I saw them um, with uh, with Willie Nelson and uh, and Eric Church. So it was, it was oh, a cool. Oh, that's awesome. And, yeah, and, Cheryl, and Cheryl Crow, too. So wow. Yeah, I saw them at uh, Madison Square Garden. And uh, they actually came down and did a, uh, a show at the Orpheum in New Orleans when I was down there. Went there for that show. I mean, anytime I can, I can see them live. They're great. And obviously, being in Carolina, they're only, I think they're from Cornelius, which is only about like 30, 40 minutes north of North Carolina of Charlotte. So, but anyway. So, would you be a, uh, would you be a roadie? What, what, what would the non um, playing? Oh, my goodness. Be? Okay. Back to the question. So, I was, <laughs> uh, so I was a, a pre, a kinesiology pre physical therapy major in, in, uh, in college. And actually, I just re enrolled back into school to finish up my degree or at least try to. Um, so most likely I would have, uh, if, if football would have worked out, I probably would have went to uh, grad school, PT school. Um, and I would have my PhD in physical therapy and then be working on that side of things. Um, whether that would be strength coach or whether it would be, uh, actually working as a PT. I know my, uh, but the reason I chose PT, my dad, my dad was a physical therapist. He worked in geriatrics. Um, growing up. So I was always, 
shop around it in, in and out of the nursing homes and helping him out. Like that was my favorite thing to do is go to work with him on Fridays and Saturdays and um, help out. But uh, yeah, that's, that's probably where I'll be at. All right, Keith's stuck on mute there. Oh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> no, no, so, no, AJ, good stuff. Um, we appreciate you coming on, talking a little football. I want to be respectful of your time. I love your shirt, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sweet. Here we go. Yeah, man. Like I, yeah, I really, um, you know, I, I know we kept it very football, but it was, you know, good talk. I appreciate you uh, sharing what you shared and just kind of giving our listeners some insight to, um, you know, what the COVID year was like and in your career so far. And best of luck, man. I'm definitely a big Josh Allen fan being from New York. Um, New York Giants, my favorite team, but you know, we share love everywhere. <laughs> well, you got, well, it's cause, you got cause, cause they're a Jersey team, Keith. No, cause cause I played for them. Right. But that's the real <laughs> New York team there. <laughs> Hey, I like the bills. Cool. AJ, what's the best way to get you? Twitter, Instagram? What's your favorite? Uh, Instagram. All right. Instagram. I have a Twitter account. I haven't touched it in like four years. I got I got off of Twitter uh, quite a long time ago. So, so yeah, I'm on Instagram. Um, and, and that's kind of where I do most of my stuff. So cool. Awesome. You got any charity well, work we're for gonna foundations? Send you a bag. We're, hold on. I want to let them know we're going to send them a bag of yeah. coffee. We're going to send Both. them a bag of coffee. Yeah, I need a bag of coffee. Um, it's foundation. I don't have my own foundation set up, unfortunately. Um, when I was in New Orleans, I worked uh, very closely with Team Gleason. Obviously, you know Steve. Yeah. Steve Gleason, the history with uh, ALS and everything that they do um, to help people across the country that have been diagnosed with the disease. But I also work very closely with Son of a Saint. Um, and, and they're a, a non for profit, um, basically, organization that teams up underprivileged uh, boys within the city of New Orleans with mentors um, and gets them education, different opportunities. I mean, it's it's an amazing. If you guys want to take a look at it, uh, some of the same, um, they're great. They're they're fantastic. They've uh, they've grown exponentially. It seems like over the past four to five years, they started off with like five boys. And now this next year, they're going to be almost like 120. Um, so, and it's all funded by donations and then people and mentors that take time out of their day to, uh, to sponsor children and, and, and young boys um, in the city. So uh, those are two organizations that I've been most closely tied with over these past few years. And I still try to do as much as I can with them. So. Fantastic. Yeah. We love to push that off the field stuff, particularly when it comes to that, uh, philanthropic side of it i know keith's got to go back to slinging some barista uh yeah, stuff over some, there sling some barista stuff down here or up here <laughs> yeah, i got to we'll get so, you we'll get your information and send you um a signature blend i appreciate it well, my, guys, um, this, club. Again, this was this was really fun i really do appreciate it and if you want to be on again i would love to come back on so oh, just, nice perfect you guys want yeah, we're definitely, definitely keeping an eye on what the what the team's doing too. Exciting to watch. We'll get you before the season for sure. Right. Perfect. 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 Until until next week, we're gonna wrap this. I'm Don. That's Keith Bullock. Thank you to AJ Klein for joining us. Peace. Peace. <laughs>